Welcome to the third and final part of the RSET webinar series, Monitoring Coastal and Estuarine Water Quality, Transitioning from MODIS to VIRS. My name is Sean McCartney, and I'm joined today by my colleagues, Amita Mecta and Juan Torres Perez. In this third and final part, we'll be providing demonstrations for monitoring MODIS and VIRS-based water quality in select study areas. As a reminder, there will be one homework assignment which can be accessed from the RSET website. Answers must be submitted via Google Form, and the due date for submitting the homework is October 5th. A certificate of completion will be awarded to participants who attend all live webinars and complete the homework assignment by the due date. You will receive a certificate approximately two months after the completion of the course from Marinas Martin. The outline for today's training will be first providing a background on the study areas used in the demos, which are the Chesapeake Bay and the Rio de la Plata. And then my colleague Amita Mecta will provide a demonstration of MODIS and VIRS-based water quality monitoring in both the study areas. The first study area we would discuss before a demonstration on water quality monitoring will be the Chesapeake Bay. The Chesapeake Bay is located in the mid-Atlantic region of the eastern United States, shown in the map on the right. The Chesapeake Bay is the largest estuary in the United States, stretching 322 kilometers from its northern end at Havre de Grasse, Maryland, to Virginia Beach, Virginia. The bay and its tidal tributaries have roughly 18,000, 1,800 kilometers of shoreline, more than the entire U.S. West Coast. The Chesapeake Bay was formed about 10,000 years ago when glaciers melted and flooded the Susquehanna River Valley, the bay's main tributary. The bay is surprisingly shallow. Its average depth, including all tidal tributaries, is about 6.4 meters, or 21 feet. The Chesapeake Bay watershed includes parts of six states, the states of Delaware, Maryland, New York, Pennsylvania, Virginia, and West Virginia, and the entire District of Columbia. The area of the Chesapeake Bay watershed is roughly 165,760 square kilometers. The watershed's land-to-water ratio is 14 to 1, the largest of any coastal water body in the world. The watershed dra drains five geologic provinces from the continental interior to the coast in the following order, the Appalachian Plateau, the Valley and Ridge, the Blue Ridge, the Piedmont, and the Coastal Plain. The largest rivers in the watershed are, in order from largest to smallest, the Susquehanna, the Potomac, the James, the Rappahannock, and the York Rivers. The Susquehanna River is the bay's largest tributary and contributes about half of the bay's fresh water. Collectively, the Chesapeake's three largest rivers, the Susquehanna, the Potomac, and the James Rivers, provide more than 80% of the fresh water to the bay. The bay receives about half of its water volume from the Atlantic Ocean in the form of salt water. The other half, the fresh water, drains into the bay from the enormous 165,760 square kilometer watershed. The watershed is home to more than 18 million people, 10 million of whom live along or near the bay's shores. Before Europeans arrived, there were several confederations of tribes in the region. The people spoke languages that were part of the immense Algonquian language family that reached from the southeast of what is today the United States, up the northeast coast into what is now Canada, across to the Great Lakes, and even to some parts of the Great Plains. The word Chesapeake is an Algonquin word referring to a village at a big river. These languages were not mutually intelligible, but they bore enough similarities 
to ena enable peoples of the Chesapeake region to communicate with one another. When the English established their first American colony in Jamestown, Virginia in 1607, the Chesapeake Bay region included three major native chiefdoms, systems of government made up of a group of tribes under the influence of a central chief. The three chiefdoms included the Powhatan, the Piscataway, and the Nanticoke. Most of the tribes living in the Chesapeake Bay region belonged to one of these three chiefdoms, although there were some tribes who kept their independence. Communities lived close to water bodies where they hunted, fished, and farmed beans, maize, tobacco, and squash. Tens of thousands of people who identify as American Indian live in the Chesapeake region today. The Chesapeake Bay supports more than 300 species of fish, shellfish, and crab. During the winter, the bay supports 87 species of wa water birds. Nearly 1 million waterfowl winter on the bay, which is approximately one-third of the Atlantic coast's migratory population. The birds stop to feed and rest on the bay during their annual migration along the Atlantic Migratory Bird Flyway. Approximately 284,000 acres of tidal wetlands grow in the Chesapeake Bay region. Wetlands provide critical habitat for fish, birds, crabs, and many other species. Submerged aquatic vegetation, also known as underwater grasses, grow on the shallow waters of the Chesapeake Bay and its streams, creeks, and rivers, and are a critical part of the bay ecosystem. They provide wildlife with food and habitat, oxygenate water, absorb nutrient pollution like nitrogen and phosphorus, trap particles of sand, silt, and sediment, which might otherwise cloud the water, and reduce erosion by slowing water currents, anchoring bottom sediment in place, and softening waves that break along the shoreline. Underwater grass growth is hindered by pollutants that cloud the water. These pollutants include excess nutrients, which fuel the growth of dense algae blooms and suspended particles of sand, silt, and sediment. These grasses also act as an excellent measure of Chesapeake Bay health. Although underwater grasses are sensitive to pollution, they respond fairly quickly to improvements in water quality. This means their abundance is a good indicator of restoration progress. According to estimates from the United States Department of Agriculture, Natural Resources Conservation Service, there are more than 83,000 farm operations comprising nearly 30% of the Chesapeake Bay watershed. As essential as agriculture is to lives and economies, excessive tillage practices, over-irrigating, and over-applying fertilizer and pesticides can pollute rivers and streams, pushing nutrients like nitrogen and phosphorus and sediment into waterways. Agriculture is the single largest source of nutrient and sediment pollution into the bay. When farmers overly irrigate their fields, excess water that is not absorbed into the soil can wash into local waterways, carrying with it soil and sediment, fertilizers and pesticides, and nutrient-rich animal manure. According to 2010 estimates from the United States Environmental Protection Agency, livestock manure and poultry litter account for almost half of the nutrients entering the bay. Federal, state, and local governments are working with farmers across the watershed to curb agricultural runoff. Conservation tillage practices leave soils undisturbed, leaving a field less prone to erosion. Cover crops are also being grown to provide soil cover and prevent erosion. They provide ground cover, reduce erosion, suppress weeds, reduce insect pests and diseases, absorb excess fertilizer, reduce nutrient leaching, and enrich soil with organic matter. While nutrients are a natural part of the Chesapeake Bay ecosystem, nutrients have never been so abundant in the environment. Before humans built roads, homes, and farm fields, most nutrients were trapped and absorbed by forest and wetland plants. 
As these habitats were removed to accommodate a growing population, nutrient pollution to the bay increased. Almost all people and industries in the watershed, even some outside of the watershed, send nutrients into the bay and its tributaries. Nitrogen and phosphorus are the two nutrients of concern in the watershed. In general, these nutrients reach the bay from three sources, wastewater treatment plants, urban, suburban, and agricultural runoff, and air pollution. Each year, the Susquehanna River provides the Chesapeake Bay with about 41% of its nitrogen loads and 25% of its phosphorus loads. Nutrients that run off the land and into the water through urban, suburban, and agricultural runoff come from a range of sources, including lawn fertilizers, septic systems, and livestock manure. Air pollution emitted by cars and trucks, industries, gas-powered lawn tools, and other sources contribute about one-third of the total nitrogen load entering Chesapeake waterways. This air pollution can come from any location within the bay's airshed, which me measures about 570,000 square miles and stretches to Canada, Ohio, and South Carolina. More than three quarters of the Chesapeake Bay's tidal waters are considered impaired by chemical contaminants. Chemical, chemical com contaminants into the bay and its tributaries come from agricultural runoff, stormwater runoff, wastewater, and air pollution. A 2010 report from the United States Environmental Protection Agency found the extent and severity of mercury contamination to be widespread in the watershed. Since the 17th century, watershed-wide changes in land use and land cover have disrupted the natural processes of erosion. There are two major sources of sediment, eroding land and stream banks, called watershed sources of sediment, and eroding shorelines and coasts. Watershed erosion increases when land is cleared of vegetation to make way for agriculture and development. Scientists estimate that most of the sediment that flows into the Chesapeake Bay comes from watershed sources. In the Bay watershed, river basins with the highest percentage of agricultural lands yield the highest amount of sediment each year. Basins with the highest percentage of forest cover, on the other hand, yield the lowest amount of sediment. Eroding shorelines and near shore areas, as well as the resuspension of already eroded sediments, are known as tidal sources of sediment. Tidal erosion increases when shoreline vegetation is removed and there are not enough bay grasses growing in the offshore shallows to lessen the force of waves against the shoreline. When there are too many sediment particles suspended in the water, the water becomes cloudy and muddy looking. Cloudy water does not allow sunlight to reach the plants that grow on the bottom of the bay's shallows. Without sunlight, these plants, including underwater grasses, they die, which affects the young fish and shellfish that depend on them for shelter. Nutrients and chemical contaminants can bind with sediment, spreading throughout the bay and its waterways. Fish and shellfish that live and feed on or near contaminated sediment can con become contaminated themselves, triggering fish consumption advisories in various portions of the watershed. Excess sediment can smother oysters and other bottom-dwelling species. Accumulating sediment can also clog ports and channels, affecting commercial shipping and recreational boating. As more people move into the Chesapeake Bay watershed, more land is cleared for the development of roads, homes, and businesses. Residents have expanded out of traditional urban centers and into bigger houses on larger lots, turning forests, farms, and other valuable landscapes into subdivisions, shopping centers, and parking lots, and impacting the health of the bay's rivers and streams. Between 1982 and 1997, the watershed lost more than 750,000 acres of forest land to development, a rate of about 100 acres per day. 60% of the region's forests have been divided by roads, and subdivisions into fragments. Fragmented forests are less resilient to disturbances and more prone to wildfires, 
invasive species, and other negative influences. Development is also linked to air quality and water quality. People who live outside of urban centers often spend more time traveling in vehicles to reach their destinations. This increases congestion on the road and pollution in the air. Vehicle emissions are a source of nitrogen oxides, which account for two-thirds of the airborne nitrogen that ends up in the bay and contributes to ground-level ozone pollution. Roads, rooftops, and parking lots are impervious surfaces. When rain falls onto an impervious surface, it can pick up harmful pollutants before entering storm drains, rivers, and streams. A rise in impervious surfaces means a rise in stormwater runoff, which alters natural stream flow and lowers water quality. The second study area we will discuss before a demonstration on water quality monitoring will be the Rio de la Plata, located in South America. The Rio de la Plata begins at the confluence of the Uruguay and Paraná rivers and flows eastward into the South Atlantic Ocean. Depending on the geographer, the Rio de la Plata may be considered a river, an estuary, a gulf, or a marginal sea. It is the widest river, or estuary, in the world, with a maximum width of 220 kilometers. The principal sub-basins in the watershed are the Paraná, Paraguay, and Uruguay rivers. Fresh water comes principally from the Paraná River, the Rio de la Plata's main tributary. Both the Paraná and Uruguay rivers are tidally influenced for about 190 kilometers. The Rio de la Plata is drained by a transboundary river basin comprising parts of five countries. They are Bolivia, Brazil, Paraguay, Uruguay, and Argentina. The area of the Rio de la Plata basin is 3,170,000 square kilometers. It is the second largest drainage basin in South America after the Amazon. The basin is bounded to the west by the Andes Mountains and to the northeast and the east by the Brazilian Plateaus and the Sierra del Mar, respectively. The groundwater system from within the basin pro provides recharge for the Guarani Aquifer, one of the largest groundwater reservoirs in the world. Itaipu Reservoir in the Paraná River is the largest dam in the basin and is the second largest hydroelectric plant in the world. The basin discharges water into the Atlantic Ocean at an average rate of 22,000 cubic meters per second and carries an estimated 57 million cubic meters of silt into the Rio de la Plata each year. The shipping route from the Atlantic Ocean to Buenos Aires is kept open by continual dredging. Before the arrival of the Spanish and Portuguese empires in the first half of the 16th century, the basin was composed of small tribes of peoples who survived by farming, hunting, and fishing, and probably never reached more than 10,000 to 20,000 people. The northern basins of the Alto Paraná and Paraguay rivers were inhabited primarily by Guayacuru and Bororo speaking peoples. Nomadic hunter-gatherers roamed Mato Grasso to the west and the Pantanal to the north. To the south, along the Paraguay and Alto Paraná rivers, the Guarani occupied semi-permanent villages and cleared patches of surrounding forest for the cultivation of maize, cassava, and other crops. Located in the gently sloped upper reaches of the Paraguay River Basin, is a, re is a region called the Pantanal. The Pantanal encompasses the world's largest tropical wetland area, about 3% of the entire world's wetlands, and the world's largest flooded grasslands. Roughly 80% of the Pantanal floodplains are submerged during the rainy seasons, nurturing a biologically diverse collection of aquatic plants and helping to support a dense array of animal species. The Pantanal is roughly 150,000 square kilometers, 
with elevations ranging from 80 to 150 meters above sea level. In the Paraguay River portion of the Pantanal, water levels rise between 2 to 5 meters seasonally, with most rainfall occurring between November and March. This massive wetland has the largest concent concentration of crocodiles in the world, with approximately 10 million caimans. Jaguars, the largest feline in the Americas, hunt caiman in the Pantanal, which has one of the highest density of jaguars anywhere in the world. The Pantanal is also home to the biggest parrot on the planet, the hyacinth maca. Citing these animals and others helped attract the one million tourists who visit the Pantanal every year. According to the World Wildlife Fund, around 95% of the Pantanal is under private ownership, the majority of which is used for cattle grazing. Another threat to the Pantanal is pollution from sewage systems and pesticides that run off into the floodplains. More than twice as big as the state of California, the Gran Chaco contains South America's second largest biome behind only the Amazon rainforest. It is a hot and arid alluvial plain located east from the Andes mountain range formed by the, by the deposit of sediments. One of the continent's last frontiers, agricultural expansion driven by cattle and soy production is the biggest threat to the natural ecosystems of the Gran Chaco. From dry thorn forests and cactus stands to palm savannas that flood in the wet season, the Gran Chaco has diverse landscapes and wildlife. The Chaco woodlands have been gradually replaced with cropland and ranches over the past several decades, but it's disappearing even faster in recent years. From 2010 to 2012, for example, Argentina, Paraguay, and Bolivia, the three countries that share most of the Chaco, lost native vegetation at an average rate of more than one acre per minute. By 2030, Gran Chaco is projected to lose millions of additional acres of native vegetation. The Pampas are South American lowlands that have the most fertile soils in the Rio de la Plata Basin. The Pampas is one of the most extensive grassland regions in the world, and with a temperate climate and precipitation that is evenly distributed throughout the year, it makes the region highly suitable for agriculture. The area of the Pampas is 1,200,000 square kilometers, and most of the native vegetation has been replaced by agriculture and cattle ranching. Central Argentina boasts a successful agricultural business with crops grown in the Pampas south and west of Buenos Aires. The Pampas contains 90% of Argentina's grain production and 48% of the cattle stock. Urban centers of Argentina and Uruguay are set along the shores of the Rio de la Plata, where 12.8 million people live in Buenos Aires and its metropolitan area. High urbanization and industrialization concentrated on the inner zone of the estuary generates pollutants, such as nutrients, organic matter, effluent sewage, that pose a threat to biota and human health. Dredging and modification of coastal wetlands have altered the morphology of the coast, interfering with the integrity of the physical habitat and biological processes. The main drivers impacting aquatic ecosystems in Rio de la Plata are industry, deforestation, sedimentation, nutrient runoff, irrigation projects, population growth, intensive agriculture, and construction of dams and reservoirs. Now that we've provided a background to the study area, I'll now hand it off to my colleague Amita Mekta for a demonstration of MODIS and VIRS water quality monitoring for the Chesapeake Bay and Rio de la Plata. Amita, over to you. Thank you so much, Sean, for a great overview and very interesting information about the two basin regions that we've chosen, uh, the Chesapeake Bay and Rio de la Plata. Uh, this information gives us insight into what factors 
uh, might be contributing to water quality parameters in these two water bodies. And so what we need to do today is compare water quality parameters derived from Modis and Beers and see what kind of differences we get. This is necessary because as we talked earlier, when Modis mission ends, we want to continue the time series with Beers. And to do that, we have to understand or quantify what kind of biases and differences we get between Modis and Beers so that we can access those uh, regionally and make uh, longer time series from Modis and Beers. And so with that in mind, we will do comparison of water quality parameters. Remember that in the first session, we downloaded uh, level one data from Modis and Beers. And in session two, we uh, learn to derive water quality parameters, so level two ocean color parameters, from level one data using CDAS and OCSSW. And we also had a demonstration of visualization of several of those parameters. And so that's where we're going to start today and start comparing data. So I'm going to stop this presentation and actually go to see that. So I have already loaded one file in CDAS here. So this is Modis for GCPK and this is Global A. Also recall that not only we converted level 1 to level 2, but we used this tool to convert the image into geographical left long projection. And so I'm using that reprojected file that we saved uh, last week. So if this is going to be a concentration that's at landmark just like last time. And next thing we want to do is we want to crop Modis and Weir's images to the same dimension or same geographical latitude longitude. And so for that, what we're going to do is let's take one sample image, this is a set of July Modis image, and we're going to use this tool. It creates a subset tool. So click here. And here now we see the image. And this is special subset. You can also do band subset. So then you can pick different bands um, to subset. But let's just do the special subset in first. So you can adjust this window and select the exact region that you want to crop this image to. And we're going to remove this extra land as well as Atlantic Ocean Park and just keep Chesapeake Bay into focus. And then what we would do is it gives us a start and end scan. So X and Y coordinates are given. Also geo coordinates are there. So what we want to do is note down these geo coordinates so that each image that we use for comparison, we crop to the same uh, geographical region. So I'm going to note this down. So that region is the same. So these are north, south, east, west coordinate in latitude and longitude. And then you can say, okay, and it creates a subset. So it's a reprojected file that is so next, what we want to do is do the same with Weir's file. So let's scan the Weir's file first. Again, for these are the reprojected file on the 16th of July. This is Weir's. And so now what we are going to do is, instead of adjusting the window, we are going to use the same coordinates. So just bear with me while I enter these numbers here so that we have the same coordinates. Okay. And so that is the region now chosen and we can say OK. So now we have these two subsetted files from Modis and Vias. Let's see how they look like. So when we look at the same bank, A, now it shows 
that it's just focusing on the Chesapeake Bay and again we can add landmarks to this. So now we have two subsetted five activities. But they are not on the same grid. So what we are going to do before we actually do comparison, uh, we are going to do co-location. So go to raster, co-location. Okay. And so this is the reference file. The uh, reference file we are going to use, the modis file. Uh, we are going to use the subsetted file here. So this is subsetted file from Modis and now we are going to add products and when you click here it you can choose this subset file. So what this does is adds this weirs file which would be co-located with the Modis file. It's going to be in CDAS format and here you can actually give it a name and also a directory where the file will be saved. So we can say Chesapeake Bay co-located file for 16th July 2021. This is our descriptive name here. Okay. And it's in the same directory and then you can say run. So now we have CD co-located 16th of July 2021. Let's look at this. If you look at this file and look at bands, you can see this master and then the one that is co-located is this. So you can see all of them are here now. They are co-located. So now we have this co-located file. We can take difference between modis and weirs what quality parameters in this case chlorophyll so let's do that and we're going to use raster math band for that uh, this is selected as target product and we will choose this edit expression here all the rasters from this co-located file are there and these are the math expressions, addition, subtraction, etc. And we're going to choose subtraction. This one we can choose modis chlorophyll. And here we will choose fierce chlorophyll and take the difference. And we can give this band a name. We will fill a M minus B and 16 July 2021. So this is modis minus B is group A and uh, we can say OK. So here is the difference raster and let's add a color to it. Okay, and also add landmass to it and look at the differences here. Uh, the range is shown here that's displayed. Actual minimum and maximum values we will find out um, when we look at the raster statistics. But an uh, important thing to see here is this pixel value. When you move this, you will see what the modis chlorophyll is, what is, what weirs chlorophyll is, and what the difference is showing. So if all these greens and yellow, they are between 10 and 20. You can add color table, it's hard to read, but if you see the coastal and shallow region, here is where somewhat larger differences are found, like almost 50 here, here also it's 45, 34. So there are uh, in the shallow, uh, sh shallow part of the bay, maybe it's more turbid, and because of that, uh, there is difference between 
Mears and Modis. It, it's also possible that algorithms um, are behaving differently in those regions from Modis and Mears. So one way to work with this is to have dense in situ measurements targeted to certain areas and resolve what the differences, where the differences are coming from. Um, that's one way to look at. But if you look at overall comparison, what we're going to do is we're going to pick this cluster and do statistics on it. This is the symbol for statistics. When you click on it, it shows statistics. So this is number of pixels. This is minimum and maximum value actually some pixels are that high but if you look at the mean difference it is 7.6 milligrams per meter cube with standard deviation of about 15.7 milligrams per meter cube this is the median and these are all percentile values so what you can see is that 90 percentile value um, is 18.4 milligrams per meter cube. So 90% of locations uh, are within that, uh, that value. And so that is the comparison. This is just one image we are doing. Ideally, we would be doing it uh, for a long time series and several seasons to get good estimates of uh, biases and regions where uh, these biases or differences are larger. Um, so this is how you would compare uh, different parameters and we can uh, see that for SSD also. I have already done so. I have loaded these rasters here, uh, Modis and Weir's SSD, and this is the difference. So I went to the same procedure and here you can see that the difference is um, this minus 3.9, 2.45 uh, and uh, actually you can look at the table here to see exact values uh, of, uh, of the data and as you go here you can see the differences uh, it's, it's much less uh, it's within uh, degree most of the time and we can also do the same thing with statistics. So this is the difference also and if you look at SST statistics um, mean difference is minus uh, 0.18 with some deviation of 3.2 degrees Celsius and uh, these are the percentile values. So it's less than a degree uh, comparison between Modis and Weir's SSD. So that is pretty good. So uh, these are the two main parameters we looked at um, and you can repeat this for other parameters uh, considering the time we have. We will quickly look at the second region. So just moving on to the second case study uh, for the de la Plata region. Uh, we did exactly the same thing, uh, take the reprojected file, create subset using the uh, create subset tool and then co-locate and then take difference. So this is chlorophyll A concentration from Modis, this is from Veers and you can see this striping here and then this is the difference between Modis and Veers chlorophyll A. Uh, concentration in milligrams per meter cube. You can see that the uh, values um, are uh, m blues are small values minus 2 point minus 0 0.25 uh, and these are the large differences here you can see almost um, more than 18 or so as you can see in the pixel region. I've done exactly the same for SSD and here also the differences are less than half a degree so that way but you can see the striping um, in this and which comes from Veer's data. So for that um, we have a paper that talks about how to remove this striping. Um, the reasons why Veer's data have striping the way um, 
the instruments working. Also, there is uh, this bow tie effect that comes into play. And uh, we'll see that paper in a minute. But uh, final thing to see here is, let's see uh, statistics for uh, SST. And as we can see, mean is 10th of a degree Celsius and uh, standard deviation is 0.24. 90 um, percentile value is as low as uh, 0.3. And if you look at chlorophyll difference and look at the statistics, uh, what it shows is that the mean difference is 3 milligrams per meter cube with about 7 milligrams per meter cube of standard deviation. And as you can see, so for both regions that we've looked at, uh, in Chesapeake Bay and Rio de la Plata, overall, when you look at the regions, um, the, the differences are not large. There are outliers in the coastal regions, and these are the values we have to explore why uh, they are so large. Is it because the algorithms are not working well in those regions, or are, there, are these in shallow waters, are they in turbid waters? Um, so these are some of the issues that need to, need to be explored for regionally. But this allows us to see where um, these uh, points are, where there are huge differences, and then how to resolve them, perhaps maybe have um, dense in-situ network, um, in-situ measurements network, just for the validation purpose or for developing algorithms. Well, thank you, Amita, for such a wonderful demonstration uh, in both the, the study areas. Uh, as a recap, thank you, everybody, for tuning in for this three-part RSET training. As a summary of what we've covered over the all three parts, uh, we've learned about MODIS and VIRS image processing for water quality monitoring using NASA CDAS and OCSSW software. We learned about the comparison of selected water quality parameters from both MODIS and VIRS for two select study regions. Those were the Chesapeake Bay in the United States and the Rio de la Plata in South America. And from, we also learned about MODIS and VIRS level one image uh, chlorophyll A concentration, SST, PIC, POC, and CDOM index, uh, and how they were obtained using OCSSW and ITGEN software. We also learned about CDAS image processing features to geolocate, calibrate, spatially subset, co-locate and to conduct, conduct band map were also introduced throughout these three parts. MODIS and VIRS chlorophyll A concentration and sea surface temperature were compared as indicators of algal bloom that may lead to hypoxia. Also, we covered sample images from July 2021 of this year showed that MODIS and VIRS chlorophyll A and sea surface temperature in the Chesapeake Bay and Rio de la Plata show reasonable overall agreement, but in shallow turbid waters, the differences are substantial and require further investigation and understanding. We also learned that VIRS images show striping due to bow tie deletion and image striping, and these are associated with multi-detector arrangement, and images must be corrected before use. Primarily, water quality data retrievals are missing due to presence of clouds and also in shallow and turbid waters. Detailed comparison of MODIS and VIRS water quality parameters on daily to seasonal timescales are required for assessing, adjusting, and extending the MODIS water quality time series with the VIRS water quality parameters. The current algorithms use global coefficients. For better estimation of water quality, accurate algorithm development, and validation with systematic regional in-situ data and proper atmosphere correction are required. And finally, RSET is planning an advanced webinar with hands-on exercises to, to develop regional algorithms for retrieving water quality parameters for both MODIS and VIRS together with available in-situ data. That training will be coming up sooner than you think, so please uh, join the RSET listserv so you can learn about this upcoming training, and we do hope that you will all join us for that so you can get some more hands-on experience. And with that, we will now transition to the question and answer portion of this today's training.
Okay, so we've got some good questions coming in. We hope that uh, they will continue. So uh, please do, uh, if you have a question, please uh, put it into the, uh, the, the question and answer box and we will address them as they come in. So question number one, since the chlorophyll A products from MODIS are derived with the visible channels, which depend on the sunlight, do the daily chlorophyll A products only represent the daytime measurement? Uh, Amita, I'm sorry, can you please repeat? Yes, can you hear me? Uh, yes, we can. Yes. Uh, Yes, so uh, that is true. Uh, in daytime, what is images are used to derive chlorophyll A concentrations. So the values you see are really for that time. Yes. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much. And question number two CDAS can be downloaded in Windows. To access OCSSW software, access to the log file directory, directory is required. From where can I find help with such matters? Detailed help for Windows users are required in this regard. Uh, yes, I, that is true. So right now, OCSSW is uh, not, works, not working on Windows, but it's coming soon. Links provided in the previous session, uh, uh, they have all the details where to get all the uh, software uh, directories and uh, the file requirement that you are asking. Okay, great. And we would also refer that uh, to, uh, uh, answer to the previous, um, in, in part two of this, we did provide a little bit more detail as well as some links. So hopefully whoever asked that question uh, can go to the uh, Q&A document, which is on our website, and you can uh, read some more about, uh, about gaining an answer to that as well. So question number three, if we use these in-situ water quality parameters, uh, chlorophyll A example on total suspended solids with the remote sensing reflectance with machine learning, a deep learning algorithm, at least how many sampling locations should be considered? I developed a machine learning model with a limited amount of data, but I couldn't apply these uh, machine learning and decision learning uh, prediction models to satellite images uh, because I'm not very familiar with these Python uh, modules, uh, example, NetCDF4. Could you please arrange a webinar series related to how we can manipulate these satellite images with Python modules or machine learning, deep learning applications uh, are used for satellite imagery. Okay, I guess, uh, I'm sorry. Um, can, okay, these satellite images, uh, deep learning applications are used for satellite imagery for a regression problem, question mark? Actually, yes. Uh, recently, there have been studies. They use machine learning along with in situ and uh, uh, satellite data, co located satellite data. Um, and um, you noted your point that uh, if there's maybe a training is needed where you can manipulate this data uh, using Python. Uh, we, we, we also, you know, in, when we plan advanced training, also consider can you uh, can you use Google Earth Engine to to manipulate this data? So these are the things we are also considering. But we uh, take a note of your point that uh, uh, we can provide Python things to make this data. And Sean, this is Great, Juan. Great, thanks so much. Oh, yes, please, Juan, please go ahead. Let me add a little bit. Um, um, yes, you would need a quite a, probably a quite a substantial amount of data 
particular if you're dealing with, with machine learning. Um, I will, I just so happened that uh, last year there was a paper that came out from, from a colleague, uh, Nima Pavlevan and, and others in remote sensing of the environment that uh, taken that it's not for MODIS and BIRS in particular, the, their approach was for Sentinel-2 and Sentinel-3, so MSI and, and OLCHI. Uh, but it was for inland and coastal waters and um, with, a, with a machine learning approach. So I will include, uh, I'm going to uh, add that link to uh, to this uh, answer in particular, so it, because it might have uh, uh, not only the paper itself, but it might also have on other references that are uh, useful for our uh, participants. Uh, thank you so much, Juan, and, and thank you, Amitra. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Juan. That would be very helpful. And question four, can the co-located co data and other future subproducts uh, be served as net CDF files for analysis outside of CDETs? So that is a good question. Uh, since uh, anyone please add uh, to this, um, I'm thinking, just now thinking that uh, if we provide global uh, co located data, uh, so, so all the water quality parameters we can co locate and provide, but um, eventually, uh, regionally, those differences will have to be. Uh, understood and analyzed. So it's it's better to do your own uh, co-location. I think. Yeah, I agree, Amita. And uh, and I was uh, I was looking into the CDAS uh, help uh, uh, site, and I'll, I'll I'll also add the link here. But it it does show that uh, that you should be able through the export tools. Uh, uh, <coughs> Uh, um, link on the on the on, on the tool on, on CDAS, it, should, it does show that you should be able to to export a net CDF uh, file. I don't know in particular about the co-located or sub products, but but you can definitely ex uh, do some exportations uh, in in net CDF uh, uh, formats. Wonderful. Yeah, thank you to both. Uh, question number question five. five. How can we download CDAS on Windows? And uh, we've provided a link for you. Thank you, Juan. Here's the link for Windows, Mac, and Linux. So please use that link if you're wanting to download CDAS on Windows. Uh, question number six. What is the tool to download time series data automatically? I've used PyModus earlier, and some functions of graph processing unit tools don't work for time series analysis. Uh, how would be in the future? So um, you can download time series of images using what we did in session one, that you can decide, um, you can subset data uh, according to time, you will get the entire time series of all these images. If you are trying, if you are thinking about getting pixel by pixel of time series, um, there is a way CDAS can work. Uh, uh, it's faster if you do it through command line and not GUI. So uh, there is a way to do time series uh, for each pixel. There is, there is the tool box available from OCSSW, and uh, we will provide you to that. It's called GPT. Uh, and I will post that. Uh, excuse me a minute. Okay, great. Thank you, Mita. And question number seven, do you have any plan to bring CDAS tools slash library to process in a cloud data and processing platform like Google Earth Engine or like Open Data Cube? So this is a question for uh, NASA Ocean Biology Group. 
um, and we can convey this question to them. Okay, question number eight. How to do a difference technique, but using images more than two time span, example given year one, year two, year three, year four, year five. I'm not about So, um, I guess you can take mean of all years and then uh, take individual year and see how that differs from the mean. So, look at the anomaly for each year. That's one way to look at difference. Or you can take one reference year and with respect to that, how each year, uh, other years differ, you can take it with that. Okay, and, and question number nine, I believe, is, is somewhat in, in related to question eight. Uh, it has to do with um, anomaly images. So how can I say the co-located image is an anomaly image, or how can I produce an anomaly image? So, um, initially, we, we co-located images and then took uh, differences. So, that is the way to do it. Uh, so, if you co-locate multiple years and their means and then take difference, you will get co-located elements. So, basically, just co-locate uh, all the images that you want to compare. All right, let's give Selwyn another second to finish typing and we'll move on to the next one. Selwyn, thanks so much. We appreciate you uh, typing as we're answering. And question number 10, what is the purpose of the water quality index used in the case study demonstration? I am assuming that you are talking about the EDOM index that we indirectly referred to. Um, we had no time to go into detail of that, but uh, the paper is given in the summary that you can read that how uh, that index tells you whether CDOM is uh, below average or above average for that particular pixel. Uh, if, if it is uh, less than one, it is it is below normal. It's above. It's above normal. So it just provides indication of seed on levels. That's what we, we just trying to show. Okay, and question uh, number 11. Uh, following up on question four, what do you mean by own collocation? I am imagining collocation to be some kind of interpolation, example given regretting tool, that is most likely some triangulation. Is that correct? Okay, what will you do uh, is whoever asked that question, we will go in and, and uh, 
we will go back and, and answer this. So please, and by the end of this week, please do go to the RSET website and you can check on uh, this Q&A doc to find an answer uh, to this specific question. So thank you to whoever asked it and whoever uh, else might be interested in uh, uh, asking a question, please do so. You can drop a question in the chat box and we will get to it in the order that they are received. So I do want to make a plug that, uh, again, with the advanced webinar that we discussed in the summary, uh, we do, our set does plan on conducting an advanced water quality, uh, coastal and estuarine water quality training, uh, uh, ideally by the end of this year. So for those that joined uh, this three-part training and you're wanting to get more practical, hands-on uh, exercises and experience using both the software as well as the, the data sets, how to uh, acquire, process and analyze uh, you know, different water quality parameters. We do hope that you will join the listserv and, and sign up for this upcoming training. Uh, we hope to get as many of you that are joining this training as possible uh, so that you can get more experience uh, with everything that you've been learning about over the past couple weeks. So do uh, stay tuned for that. And we have another question number 12. Um, Co-location is synonymous to layer stacking, question mark? So to our audience and attendees, uh, we do apologize. We, we, I feel like we have lost Amita Mekta. So she is no longer, uh, will be able to uh, answer questions, but uh, we will be answering these by this week. So please, for an answer to this question, um, co-location is synonymous to layer stacking. Please do uh, check in by uh, probably Friday at the latest where we can post all the answers to all of your questions uh, on the training page for this, uh, for this training. So question number 13, can we use CDAS software to visualize the water quality parameters in river lakes also. And this is uh, this one, Sean, I can kind of chime in a little bit. Uh, yes, you can. It will obviously, you know, there's, 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 there's several, uh, several factors to consider. One is obviously the extent of the river or lake that you that it's your you know, particular area of study and and with that also to consider which kind of uh of uh satellite data you're using remember as we always mention in, in our our set webinars um it depends a lot also on the spatial resolution of the data if uh, if uh if you have a really small lake or or, or river uh, or a uh, very narrow one maybe you know Using something like Moldis or Bears might not be useful for you because they're just the the, the spatial resolution is too coarse, um, and and in that sense you might need to rely on some other uh, sensors like um, a Landsat, Sentinel, etc. Um, but yes, you can actually the paper that I mentioned that we already included the link uh, from from Nima uh, Palevan et al they from 2020 from last year they actually part of the data that they show is from for instance from the great lakes and from other uh, uh inland waters uh as well so uh yeah you can you can refer to that again this is a paper that was concentrated on on the use of uh of uh, sentinel uh in particular but it does include areas for instance it has a it has uh, data from uh, some Japanese lakes, from the Great Lakes also, 
and uh, and so forth, and, and other or some other inland lakes in the in the U.S. Uh, as well, Estonian lakes and uh, and <clears throat> Europe and uh, and German lakes uh, as well, and as well as in New Zealand. So yes, long, uh, 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 and the the short answer is that yes, you can use CDAS to to uh, to work with water quality parameters in river or rivers and, and lakes. Again, uh, the 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 selection of your uh, satellite or remotely sensed data will depend on on the size of your lake, the whether there's a there the, there's a seasonality in the happening in those lakes. For instance, as we know, some of them there's right. might, there, um, might be the occurrence of uh, algae blooms and, and or other uh, nuisance uh, uh, in the water as well. That you the, that you have to consider the, what what is the cycle of those. Or um, uh, particularly when you're thinking about whether you want to use daily data for, let's say, MODIS or BIRS, versus if uh, something that it's uh, has a more a coarser temporal resolution, uh, it's a uh, it's uh, would be you know useful for you like uh, Landsat Sentinel on a, on a, a week or two weeks uh, <coughs> uh, temporal resolution. So uh, some those, some of the things that to to be considered. But thanks thanks for the for that question. Yeah, that's a great answer, Juan. Thanks. Thank you so much for, for, uh, for giving such a thorough answer. Mm -hmm. uh, question 14, is there a way to have another webinar addressing how to use OCSSW tools programmatically? That is a good question. Well, as a, one thing is that, and, uh, and feel free to chime in, Sean, but uh, one that we're all in Alsen in particular, we're always looking for for topics that could be interesting for our uh, participants. So we'll we'll keep it in mind. Yeah, and 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 Juan, to build off of what you just said, uh, for everybody that's attending uh, of this three-part series, you will be receiving a survey uh, uh, within the coming week. And that survey is to gauge your uh, feedback on this specific training that you're currently in. But it's also, there will be questions asked about upcoming trainings that you would like to see our set have with this, specifically within the application of, of water resources and water quality specifically. So uh, for whoever asked that question, we do hope you'll provide that feedback on, on the survey that you will be receiving soon. And for everybody that's on here, please do, uh, please do fill out that survey and reply to that because we're very serious about these and we do base all of our future trainings based on the, the survey responses from you. So uh, please do look forward to that in your email in the coming week. And question 15, please kindly share the paper that further explains the index. And we have provided that link here. So we've also, uh, uh, also Brock has put it in, the, uh, in the, the chat for everybody. So whoever asked that question, please do use that as a resource and, and, uh, and hopefully it can help guide you or answer some of the questions you may have. Question 16, is there a kind of fast semi-automatic or automatic classification technique or tool for land use and mapping using VIRS slash MODIS data? I just know that land use mapping based on MODIS and VIRS, they are available. Um, I would also uh, state that uh, our set is a number of trainings on land use land cover mapping uh, using optical data which uh, this would certainly fall within the, the purview of using VIRS and MODIS data. So we will provide links to some of those trainings uh, and hope that you will uh, go and use those as a resource if you're interested in uh, land use mapping using these data sets. And, and also, Sean, from some of some uh, from our uh, participants who are interested in Google Earth Engine, I believe we uh, you know, so some months ago, when we did the the Google Earth Engine training, we covered some of that, um, particularly for uh, for land use uh, changes. And uh, <clears throat> uh, our colleague uh, Zach Benston covered that, so might as well 
include the, the, the link or refer our participants to, to that particular training, uh, which might be useful. Excellent, Juan. Thank you so much for that's a it's a great suggestion, and we'll, we'll certainly put all those links in this uh, in the Q and A doc. So uh, whoever's interested in that, um, definitely go back to the RSET website uh, by the end of this week, where we can post this, and then you can get the links to uh, to learn more. Looks like the questions are, are start slowly uh, trickling in, but maybe stopping. I guess we'll give it another few minutes. So if you do have any last minute questions, uh, please take the opportunity to post them in the chat and we will be glad to answer them. Um, uh, but yeah, well, I guess we'll cap this at uh, 15 after. So if you have any last minute questions, please let us know. And if there's any specific applications that, that you're working at at a, uh, mm -hmm. say, a ministry or a government uh, uh, you know, an office somewhere, wherever you may be in the world, or if, it's, if you're working for a non-government organization, maybe it's a research question that you're working with, uh, if, if it's a research at, at academia, et cetera, if there's anything that, that you would like to uh, see an RSET training on, again, I want to promote that uh, we hope that you will all fill out the survey response that you'll be receiving within the week so that, uh, yeah, so we can build our future trainings around the topics that you have most interest in. So again, please do fill that out survey and we do take them very seriously. Uh, there was a question in the chat in regards to the, is there any training on Google Earth Engine? Yes, as, as I mentioned with, with we, we gave a training some months ago, uh, and, uh, and we have to, uh, uh, in question 16 in particular, in the answer, we have provided the link here for the, for the Google Earth Engine uh, uh, for land monitoring applications uh, training here. So please refer to that. And uh, there's, an, there's another question, 17. Could you please explain, explain the calculated chlorophyll A and B in the CDAS? Uh, summary table. Sometimes the quantity of substances in the water can change follow the follow, following the calculation method. Um, so we went over over this in session two, particularly on the on, on the uh, calculation of, uh, of some of the parameters of some water quality parameters, particularly uh, we went into some details for chlorophyll A, not chlorophyll B, <laughs> chlorophyll A. Um, which is typically the 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 uh, the value that it's used uh, for for ocean and coastal waters, um, and uh, and and yes, the it's it is it is uh, the, the our our participant is is, uh, is correct. Yes, sometimes I would I would I would not say sometimes I would I would say it's very frequent that the quantity or the amount of substances in the water column changes. Uh, following the the calculation method, or follow, uh, you know, pretty much on a on a, on a, on a daily basis. Uh, this is where, again, as we uh, we have uh, mentioned in in the during the through the webinar and in past uh, coastal or ocean or, or water related web webinars, this is uh, where where this kind of data, various models, is particularly useful because, as we said, you can have pretty much daily acquisitions from from both uh, sensors and that is uh, that's definitely a, an advantage particularly if you're looking at a, at a, at a, at a, at a body of water that changes uh, very frequently or that changes on a, on a daily basis um, yeah wonderful yeah thank you thank you Juan And moving down to also, question I want eight. To add, yes. Yeah, so I just wanted to add that um, I, I cannot access the link right now, but if you can post the NASA Ocean Buzzer web link, there is a forum on it. And this forum has many questions and answers that might help you. Uh, they're all related to uh, CDAS, OCSSW, as well as water quality parameters. 
how they are, they are derived, about their accuracy, uh, number of, uh, a lot of information is available from the board of questions. That is a very good addition. Thanks, Amira, for reminding us that. Uh, yes, the, the forum is, is particularly useful, uh, the, the Ocean Color Web uh, Forum, and also for the for the short demonstration that I did on, in session two for the, in, if you're interested in, in, the, in, the, in looking, you know, more into the NOAA Coast Watch uh, website, they also have a different forum as well, where, where you can uh, post questions and uh, and and uh, and also you just look at the you know previous uh, uh, questions from other from other users. So yes, definitely that is a that is a particularly useful uh, tool. Just go to go into get in, go into these forums. Um, there's uh, also even in if you look into into YouTube, uh, there's a bunch of uh, of uh, also uh, videos. Uh, instructional videos on on CDAS as well um, that uh, that might be particularly useful. I believe in the last session we included a couple of links to some of those uh, uh, videos, uh, so so please refer to that as well. Yeah, thank you, Amita and Juan. Question eighteen: I was downloading to install CDAS version eight point one point zero and was having problems, but I already have the version seven point five point three. Will that work fine too, or the new one has more in-depth knowledge? I think for the for the water quality parameters, um, you can use you can use the older version 7.5.3. If you're interested in including all G calculation, um, that uh, through GUI uh, or you know there's Sentinel three available in CDAS 8.1.0, that's not there in the version. So there are some differences, but for, for modis and beers, uh, you can use the older version. So also, uh, you know, at some point, if I select um, Otis, FMR's data files have been updated. So after November 2020 or so, older version may give you some error, and then you may have to update to the new version. But that is something that. Question 19, I've installed CDAS both on a Linux uh, HPC system and my local Mac. In both, I am experiencing long times for the software to load up at the beginning. Is there a known explanation for the slowness of the GUI? Um, I you know, I we will check with the Ocean Forum again. But it, it is true that when you first time install or update OCSSW, it takes the takes a long time. So that's true. But I I, I don't know the reason or if it's known. And question 20, can you review the concepts of empirical, semi-empirical, semi-analytical models used for water quality estimation? So we can keep that in mind. Uh, uh, we can provide references for different types of models a 
Yeah, and to add a little, a little bit, yes, there's been a number of different uh, <coughs> publications in regards to the use of, uh, or the derivation of a, of a, of empirical or semi-empirical or semi-analytical models uh, for water quality uh, parameters. We can provide some some references here um, as a, uh, that could be useful for our, for our participants. But uh, but yeah, people have been have been dealing with this, working with this for probably a couple of decades already, and uh, and there's a lot of publications out there in regards to. Uh, to all of these uh, different model uh, modeling efforts. Hey, tw question 21. Is there a direct connection between a large rainfall event, agricultural runoff, and when the impact of that can be observed in the downstream estuary? You, you can add to this, but um, it, yes, it, it is true that uh, rainfall um, and runoff through agriculture areas it, it eventually gets into, or the nutrients get into estuaries. So that depends on a number of factors. First of all, how uh, heavy was rainfall? Was how much was the soil moisture? So that decides how much was the runoff over what time period, and that uh, has that decides when exactly you will see effect uh, downstream effect on estuary. But again, uh, sediment flow not they use this information uh, that how rain rainfall runoff and other watershed parameters can affect uh, what goes into estuaries and how long. Yeah, as, as, as Amita was saying, you know, there's there's a number of different factors that affect this. Um, uh, even, for instance, the slope of the of the watershed. Um, what is the, as she mentioned, it depends on how heavy or not the rainfall event uh, was, uh, because it, this this will affect the flow of the of the river uh, downstream, and uh, and also um, there is uh, well even even if there's a if the uh, if the the river for instance has been you know canalized already where there also there's a there are um, um, dams and around the way and, and that sort of thing that sort of a structure that may or may not affect in the eventually the 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 timing of the of these uh, 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 runoff to eventually to uh, to get to the estuary of or or, or, or the coastal area uh, in particular. Um, there might be a delay, or, or you might just see it, uh, you know, on the same day. It depends. There's a, there's a number of different factors, physical physical factors and topographic factors that affect the um, the the timing of of seeing the impact in, in downstream for from runoff. Okay, question 22. Can there be large differences in values recorded between modus and beers? Yes, as we saw that there are uh, locations where these differences can be large. And that is something that people are trying to understand. And I, we suggest that you look at the um, letter and all paper that we referred to in session two. Uh, they compared most and beers uh, much quantity data in the Gulf of Mexico. And they have systematically pointed out uh, factors which can contribute to these differences.
Well, seeing that there are no more questions coming in, uh, we want to thank everybody for joining for all three parts of this webinar series. We really appreciate you taking the time out of your day and your busy, busy lives to, to join this RSET training and to learn as much as you can about uh, water quality uh, uh, monitoring using satellite data. Uh, I want to thank my colleagues, Amida Mekta, Juan Perez Torres, uh, as well as Selwyn Hudson Odoi, Brock Blevins, and Jonathan O'Brien for making this training happen. And we do hope that you will uh, take the time to fill out the survey, which will be coming in the next week. And we hope to see you all at the next RSET training. So thank you all and stay safe.